You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. On today's programme, supermarkets threaten to boycott products from Brazil over a controversial law campaigners say would lead to more deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. The cities that could be underwater by the end of the century if global warming continues at its current rate. And the world's largest coral reef restoration project, Regrowing Hope, off Indonesia's coast. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and meet those coming up with the solutions. We aim to take you to the heart of the climate crisis, explain the data driving the changes that are already affecting us, but also show you just how far we've come. Now, retailers across Europe say they'll boycott products from Brazil if the country's Senate passes a law which campaigners claim would accelerate deforestation. Environmental groups believe the bill will reward land grabbers in the Amazon rainforest who occupy properties illegally, often clear-cutting areas for agricultural use. The retailers say Brazil's environmental protections are increasingly inadequate and the land bill risks even greater threats to the Amazon. But supporters of the law argue that only by bringing properties into the legal system can they be forced to comply with deforestation laws. They say it would help small-scale farmers to clarify title deeds to land. Deforestation in Brazil surged to a 12-year high between August 2019 and July 2020, with more than 11,000 square kilometres of forest destroyed. That's an area seven times larger than Greater London. Well, with me is Peter Andrews, Head of Sustainability at the British Retail Consortium, who say they support the boycott. Uh, Peter Andrews, welcome to you. So what are these retailers demanding and why? Well, simply to withdraw the bill that is being proposed at the moment. Uh, this is the second time this bill has been put forward to the Brazilian Parliament. And uh, at the time last year, when it was originally raised, there was a big backlash from the Brazilian society, Brazilian businesses, as well as the international community. We are asking for that bill again to be withdrawn and that it's looked at very carefully to make sure that the Amazon is protected while supporting the economic development of people in the country. Well, yeah, and supporters of the bill there say that it'll help ensure compliance with deforestation laws. So realistically, how likely is it that the Brazilian government will take notice? Well, I think what's happening here is a big international demand for, for responsible practices is being demonstrated. I think, you know, it's not just the UK. There are other countries that are, are keen that this measure does not come to pass and are actually looking at what impact it could have on climate emissions globally. Um, and therefore, businesses, if this law does come to pass, will consider seriously whether they can continue to source from the country. And are these retailers responding to pressure from customers in this country? And how might customers be affected by a boycott? What do we import from Brazil? Well, certainly we know that customers don't want to be purchasing food that's linked to any deforestation. Um, and uh, I think, you know, the retailers want that, the wider society wants that. Uh, the many businesses demonstrated on the letter calling for action uh, highlights that this is a shared sort of ambition. It won't, um, on a day-to-day -day sort of basis, have a, a, a big impact on, on, our, on the customers in this country. Um, it, it tends to be the big products would be soya, so that comes into the animal feeds, uh, such as for poultry, for, for pigs and so on, that then is in for the meat production uh, that we buy in our supermarkets. So on a day-to-day on -day basis, it won't be a significant change as, as retailers will con consider sourcing from uh, alternative areas to ensure that they can continue to provide responsibly uh, produced and sourced uh, products for their customers. Peter Andrews, thank you. Let's take a look now at some of the day's other climate news. And the UN says urgent action is needed to tackle rising global hunger. At least 155 million people were impacted by food crises last year. That's an increase of 20 million from 2019. Research shows extreme weather is one of the largest causes of food shortages and famine around the world. 
Germany plans to reduce its carbon emissions by an extra 10% to 65% by 2030. Under the new targets, the country will aim to reach net zero by 2045, five years earlier than previously planned. It comes after Germany's constitutional court ruled the government must update its climate law as it didn't give enough details on cutting emissions beyond 2030. Lotus says it's built its last ever sports car that's powered entirely by petrol. The British car maker has unveiled the Amira, which will be its final vehicle to feature a traditional combustion engine. Lotus's chief executive, Matt Windle, says all future models will be fully electric or hybrid. What we wanted to do was, um, we've called it our last hurrah, really, I suppose, but it was, it was uh, a bridge for us to show new technology and where we're going in the future. And um, it, it, it's a technology jump for us, but we've, we've said with our strategy going forward that electric is the future for us and um, we'll be moving towards that before the end of the decade. Co-op says it will become the first supermarket to sell fully carbon-neutral own brand food and drinks. It's part of a new 10-point climate plan to achieve net zero emissions by 2040. Other measures include price matching its vegan own brand products with meat equivalents and cutting plastic packaging. And scientists have discovered an interesting way to keep seabirds safe. BirdLife International and the RSPB fitted 3D googly eyes onto buoys to create a floating scarecrow that keeps birds away from areas of the sea where they might get caught up in fishing nets. They found the number of long-tailed ducks in Estonian waters dropped by 30% when the scarecrow was trialled. Now, sea levels around the world could increase substantially if the burning of fossil fuels is left unchecked. That's the finding of a new report published in the journal Nature. For the first time, all of the possible scenarios from the Paris Agreement pledge to a complete abandonment of greenhouse gas targets have been modelled to predict how our oceans might be affected. So this is how sea levels have risen from 1880 to 2020. Since 1993, the melting of land ice, that's glaciers and ice sheets, has contributed to around half of this rise. The Antarctic ice sheet is the largest land ice reservoir and its ice loss is accelerating. Since the early 2000s, its mass has plummeted, losing almost 100 gigatons a year. And this is the effect it's had. Here's what's expected to happen to global mean sea levels if the world remains no more than one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels. And now look at the level if the world warmed by two degrees. At around 2070, it starts to jump. But at three degrees of warming, the rate of loss increases dramatically at around 2060. And the report says this change would be irreversible. And that would mean cities including Amsterdam, New York, Shanghai, as well as the south of London, are at real risk of being underwater by the end of the century, if no further defences are put into place. Well, Dr Tamsin Edwards is a climate scientist at King's College London and authored one of the reports published today. Dr Edwards, thanks for talking to us. So, rising temperatures are prompting rising sea levels, in part because of melting glaciers and ice sheets. What's the other reason? Well, the main other contribution to sea level rise is the expansion of the oceans as they warm, and that's not something that people necessarily know that much about. But the studies in Nature Today were both on the, the land ice part of the contribution. And what are the potential risks to human society of rising sea levels from the worst case scenario to the best case scenario? And could we potentially adapt? Well, the numbers always seem um, confusing, just like in temperatures, we think, oh, how much can a degree or two matter? Um, how much can a few centimetres or tens of centimetres matter? But it's it really shifts the extremes. Um, more sea level rise will mean more coastal flooding around the world, in some parts much worse than others, of course. Um, but we really tried to, to highlight the positive in our study, which was a, a collaboration of 84 scientists from 15 countries predicting the glaciers and ice sheets. Um, we could actually halve their contribution to sea level rise if we ramp up the ambition of our pledges from where we are sort of roughly today to limit global warming to one and a half degrees. So yes, yeah, so what exactly needs to be done to achieve that? 
Well, I mean, our paper is not really about the policies that go into place. That's the that's the concern of the countries. You know, we have COP26 coming up. People are, are the different nations are updating their pledges. You know, net zero targets. They need to have detailed plans in place about exactly how they're going to go about that. We can't just say net zero in 2050. We have to think about what happens now and what happens next year and what happens the year after. But the point is here. I think that sea level is going to rise due to the warming of the oceans and melting of ice, but we can limit the damage and we can reduce the increase in coastal flooding if we make those big, large-scale, ambitious pledges and put them into practice. And if those pledges aren't made and aren't achieved, who is most at risk? Which parts of the world are most vulnerable? Well, our study was around the global sea level picture. So really kind of how much of the ice is going into the oceans and raising sea level. So, you know, how many centimetres of, of total global sea level rise uh, will occur. Um, but there are different parts of the world which will um, be affected in different ways, depending on things like whether the land is already sinking, that, you know, some areas are sinking more than others. So, you know, it really varies regionally. And that's something that many scientists are looking at. Uh, we'll see a lot more about that with the new Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report later this summer. Dr Tamsin Edwards, thank you. Now, two years ago, the world's largest coral reef restoration project started off the coast of Sulawesi in Indonesia. Since then, around 40,000 square metres of reef has been restored, increasing coral cover from 5 to 55 per cent. The reef can be seen on Google Earth and has been regrown to spell the word hope to drive awareness of the ongoing threat of climate change and show how positive change can happen. Coral reefs support around 25% of all marine life, although they only occupy about 1% of the ocean surface. So they're biodiversity mega hotspots. We've lost about 50% of them in the last two or three decades. The biggest threat is climate change, but there's lots of other factors that cause their demise. Uh, one in particular is glass fishing that actually blows up the entire fabric of a reef, which creates a desolate rubble field rather than those sort of grey mobile rubble beds. What we're doing is putting corals back into the ecosystem. And we do that by placing corals on uh, reef stars, which are these hexagonal structures built by the local community that are interlinked and spread as a web over these vast rubble fields and you basically regrow the habitat from the ground up. And then the natural sort of processes of recovery kick in and you get little fish come in, little sized fish, big fish, and the whole system starts to regenerate. And that's all from us for today. On the show tomorrow, why the Science Museum is facing criticism for its choice of sponsor for a climate exhibition. We've got the full story here on The Daily Climate Show tomorrow. See you then. <laughs> <laughs>